Okay, let's go. Yes, sir. This is Dr. Alan Job from Cincinnati, Ohio, and I'm presenting a talk on what neonatologists should know about antenatal steroids and postnatal steroids for the International Neonatal Summit uh, from Kerala, India. And um, thank you for the opportunity for me to address you this morning. It's morning here, it's probably evening there. The slide isn't advancing. I can't advance. I can't advance the slide. Oh, there, there. I can do it over here, probably. Yes, okay, my pride. Yes, it's moving. So I just continue. Yes, sir. Please go ahead. Uh, the pro my project funding is from a variety of sources. We've been doing uh, animal models in sheep and monkey models at UC Davis with support of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. We also did a clinical PKPD study with Sinjin in Bangalore, India, and I'll talk a little bit about that. GSK has provided the steroids for the infusion studies in Australia, and Merck provided the beta-methasone acetate for us. The goals of this presentation are to uh, appreciate that preterms have IQ deficits and uh, and acknowledge that we do not, not understand the causes of that. There are differences in the drugs and effects on newborns, of course. And I wanna talk a little bit about the developmental origins of health and disease concept, which may be unavoidable because of bad effects that we cannot fix with our current therapies. I have six suggestions about dosing antenatal steroids and postnatal steroids. Okay, these are, these are just sketches that I did myself just to, for, for concept. There's two curves here. There's the normal IQ distribution for normal term babies. And then there's my sketch of what it looks like for very preterm. The preterms have three uh, red circles on them. One is, is that the the peak value is actually downscale from the normal potential. That's about 10 or 15 IQ points. We know that's true in populations. The uh, one on the shoulder there suggests that the shoulder is wider for kids in the lower IQ range. And then there's a bump at the bottom. That's for the very damaged babies. Fortunately, there's not too many of those any longer. These are studies, these, these are meta regression analysis, standardized to mean difference in IQ for extremely low birth weight or very low birth weight infants versus term controls. And you can see the, the dark curve intercepts at le, uh, about half a standard deviation below normal. Each of those circles, blue circles represents a study and the size of the circle represents the number of patients in the circle. So what this basically says that there's been no improvement in IQ between 1990 and 2010. So our little babies are still not doing optimally. Could this be the result of antenatal steroids? I think so, we just don't have any information. This is the same information with the outcome being BPD. And you can see if you, you get BPD, you have a significant deficit in your IQ uh, based on percent bronchopulmonary dysplasia in the population you're studying. So these are studies from uh, Finland a number of years ago on birth weight and head, circ head circumference. So um, these are all antenatal steroid exposed fetuses that are either preterm, born near term, or born at term. The term ones are the interesting ones because these are babies that were exposed to antenatal steroids but did not deliver uh, until term because they actually didn't never had preterm labor in all probability. And what you see is there's a deficit in uh, their birth weight and there's a deficit in their head circumference. So this is the uh, biological substrate on which our poor uh, developmental outcomes are, are occurring and antenatal steroids impact birth weight and head circumference. This is a population of 800,000 deliveries. This is uh, 
a different pu a publication of all the births from Finland from 2006 to 2017, 670,000. So the entire cohort of deliver deliveries actually favors no antenatal steroids. And the term deliveries exposed to antenatal steroids have more of a deficit. The pre terms exposed to antenatal steroids that delivered preterm actually don't have a, a, a mental or behavioral deficit in these Finnish children, probably because the steroids actually improve outcomes for the preterms, but not, not if you're given steroids and then deliver a term. So I think that's an important concept to remember. This is talking about the lung now. This is a slide I drew up a few years ago where we thought that severe BPD was actually a deficit in alveolarization. It's probably a delay in alveolarization, alveolarization but at, at term or as, as young children, these kids appear to have normal alveolar numbers based on uh, um, MRI studies. So the question really is, is how do they age? Those are those dashed lines there after they reach their normal, the preterm, the severe BPD probably may edge more rapidly than the normals do, but even the normal preterm infants age uh, more rapidly as age progresses than uh, normal term infants in terms of their airways and their alveolar number. So these are outcome studies. You all have seen these of the meta-analysis of Roberts for antenatal steroids, and they're pretty compelling. They decrease death, they decrease RDS, they decrease uh, NEC, IVH, and late onset sepsis. So there's compelling reasons why we should use antenatal steroids, but what I'm gonna tell you is I think we've been using the wrong drug at the wrong dose. This is the same kind of information conceptually. This basically is the rate of fall off of FEV1 as a child ages between uh, birth and uh, there's actually data now at 36 years of age. And so if you're a child that's born with one of those uh, upper curves, you have normal airway function as you're aging. Uh, but if you're, th that's the red curve. But if you're a preterm, uh, you end up with uh, a, a low FEV1 in middle age, which means you're very likely to develop COPD. This is also an important concept slide. This is from uh, Barbara Schmidt, looking at outcomes from her um, caffeine trial in terms of probability of a poor neurodevelopmental outcome at 18 months with added morbidities for these preterm infants. So if you have BPD, as I already showed you, you have a worse outcome. If you have brain injury, which is, um, which is uh, IVH or ROP, you have progressively uh, poor outcomes up to about 90%. So this makes a very important point that if we're going to improve outcomes, we have to try to decrease the injuries that these babies receive. And those really are BPD, NEC, brain injury, and ROP. So the summary of these outcomes in our preterm infants are that antenatal steroids may cause early aging we have some other, there, I can't, I don't have time to present the data for the preterm for the heart and lungs that uh, may be caused by antenatal steroids. The DOHAD concepts about metabolic syndrome may be a substantial risk for the preterm. All preterms seem to have an increased risk of having uh, metabolic syndrome in early life, which does, of course, predict heart disease, uh, cancer, and other bad outcomes. We unfortunately have no clue about how to avoid other than preventing prematurity. And without a thorough understanding of the developmental pathways, we're not gonna be able to develop therapies to minimize this. What we should do though, is minimize antenatal storage exposure to ideally only pregnancies that will benefit. Those are the ones that will actually deliver preterm. How to make better babies, avoid the injury, learn uh, there is no obvious to avoid the DOHOT effects, if at all possible. We don't know how to do that. 
avoid prematurity by giving antenatal steroids only to pregnancies that will benefit. And I'll talk about lowering the dose. So when we think about steroids, I think we have to think about a differential equation. So these are respiratory outcomes. These could be GI outcomes, it could be brain outcomes, it could be anything. We have fetal exposure, we have very preterm exposure. People are using a lot of steroids for blood pressure support. And then we have postnatal injury and we use them to early in the course of BPD. I'll talk a little bit about that later. And we also use them chronically for babies who have severe injury, who are in a stage of lung repair and remodeling. So it turns out that our some use of steroids is actually very high, and we have to be aware of that. We usually don't think about previous exposures. So for antenatal steroids, the drugs used are betamethasone. I think that's what's used predominantly in India, 12 milligrams. Um, twice. And so that's for 20, that the total dose is 24 milligrams. Uh, postnatal, we use dexamethasone or hydrocortisone. I'll talk a little bit about that. The WHO trial used dexamethasone or uh, uh, dexamethasone, four doses of six milligrams or two doses of 12 milligrams. Uh, Beta-methasone phosphate, it can be given as uh, two 12 milligram doses. That's what's used in the UK. The interesting thing is all of these doses are 24 milligrams. And the recommendation for the patient dying of, of uh, COVID who's in an, in an ICU to use uh, dexamethasone is a 24 milligram dose, is a 20 milligram dose. So actually the dose we're giving to women to, for risk of preterm labor is higher than the dose we give to patients dying of COVID, which probably doesn't make any sense. So what are the characteristics of adrenal function in a preterm infant? They have very low cortisol levels as a fetus. So the cortisol synthesis is only significant after about 30 weeks of age. Preterms are generally adrenal deficient at birth. And I'll show you some data that they do better when treated with low dose hydrocortisone because they're relatively adrenal sufficient insufficient. The, the pharmacology is really complicated here because we're treating the mother to treat the fetus. So the variables are the dose and root, placental transfer, clearance in the pregnant woman, clearance in the fetus, which is very slow for beta-methasone. Uh, the, the other issue is, is what is the dose for the effective pharmacodynamic outcome that we want, for example, preventing IVH or RDS or death. We actually don't know um, what that is for each of those outcomes. So this is, I think, interesting information to think about. This is a recent trial from France, which not, is not yet published and complete, on cord blood levels or maternal levels. The maternal levels are on the upper frame and the cord blood levels are on the lower frame. And the circled areas are at three to four days after the second treatment. And what you can see is that the fetus and the mother still have significant levels of, uh, this is for using uh, beta-methasone as beta-methasone acetate plus phosphate as we use celestone in Europe and in the United States. So the point of this is, is that because of the acetate slow release form of the beta-methasone, the mother still has beta-methasone in her circulation three to four days after the last treatment. And we've measured it in the women in uh, India and we can still detect it after 10 days. So, um, and the fetus still has a relatively high level, which is above the therapeutic range. Uh, after three to four days. So this is the work we did in, in uh, Bangalore. We gave groups of, of 12 women dexamethasone, that's in the, per, in the orange, beta-methasone phosphate, or the clinical drug we use in the US and in, 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 in Europe, 
And that's this mixture of beta methazone phosphate plus acetate. And what you see is the initial curve is a relatively rapid clearance. It's more rapid for dexamethasone than for beta methazone. And the triangles are actually for the celestone drug, which you can see is after 240 out to as much as 288 hours, we could, that's 10 days, 11 days, we could still measure it in the maternal circulation. So this is what happens when you give maternal cortisol or any one of these combinations of stero uh, beta methazone phosphated acetate or beta methazone phosphate or uh, dexamethazone phosphate. The initial part of the curve there at the minus 24 hours is the normal circadian rhythm in these normal non-pregnant women in uh, Bangalore. And then the next morning when their cortisols are up, if we give them a only a six milligram dose, what we do is we profoundly suppress their adrenal. And when we use the celestone treatment, it's completely suppressed for uh, almost 70 hours and it's still suppressed at 96 hours. So the take home message from this is with the standard dosing that we're using for maternal therapy, when your woman is on the labor ward, she's actually adrenal suppressed, which may not be a good idea given the stress of preterm labor on these women. This is reasonably new data from um, a very large study from France looking at cord cortisol concentrations um, in male and female infants. And it turns out that it looks like a shotgun blast. So there's a bunch of babies that have very low cortisol levels. Those are the babies that uh, are the normal preemies who have adrenal insufficiency because they haven't gotten around to make much cortisol. And those other, there's some that are extremely high those are mostly babies that had chorioamnionitis. And it turned out when they correlated cor uh, cortisol with outcomes, the babies with these high values had more BPD, more neck, and more death. So that if you have a baby that's a very preterm infant that has a high cortisol, it's probably not a good idea to give him more corticosteroids at that point when the steroids are so high. So I would suggest that when you get your initial blood values on a baby, that you also get a cortisol to try to learn if this is one of these babies with a really high cortisol level, in which case you probably don't want to be using cortisol in the first few days of life. So this, this is a summary slide. Uh, this dose of 0.125 milligrams per kilogram of, of beta acetate is half of the dose that these women get with the conventional dosing. So it's a low dose. The maternal and fetal blood levels for lung response are very low. They're less than one nanogram per milliliter, probably even lower in pregnancies. A dose of 0.06 milligrams <coughs> of beta phosphate showed less lung response in a macaque monkey. Therefore, lung maturation does not require a high peak level of steroid uh, beta levels in the fetus or dexamethasone. The fetal levels are low and, and need to be maintained for 24 hours with beta acetate. These are actual blood levels in monkeys who had effective uh, lung maturation. The, the, the black squares are beta acetate in non-pregnant monkeys. The aquamarine uh, blue is maternal levels and the green levels are in the beta in the, with beta acetate in the fetus, doing bicortosynthesis in these fetal monkeys by the skilled people at UC Davis. And so you see, we got lung maturation with a dose, exposure dose in the fetus of about one nanogram per milliliter, uh, which is way below what the mother is seeing when we give these drugs. So, um, and this is just showing the kind of response you get. We get a pressure volume curd response and a surfactant response in the BLA, BAL of these preterm monkeys with 0.125 milligrams per kilogram of, of uh, this is celestone. So 
beta acetate. Let me just say there's no drug available that's just beta acetate on the market. You can get beta phosphate, dex phosphate, or celestone. You don't, you don't have an option to use beta acetate. So um, you get a surfactant response and you also get a pressure volume response with the low dose of the beta acetate, which I just showed you caused a blood level of one nanogram per milliliter in the fetus, fetal monkeys. These are plasma levels in sheep treated with, again, this low dose of beta acetate. The maternal levels are about three nanograms per milliliter and the fetal levels are about one nanogram per milliliter. And these animals responded with lung maturation. So beta phosphate and dex phosphate are equivalent except for uh, the PK, the PK uh, is uh, fast, clearance is faster uh, with DEX than with beta phosphate. So actually DEX is a good use. It's easier to control, control um, dosing. It turns out that blood levels in monkeys and in sheep are entirely proportionate to dose. The minimum of dose and assuming anti-inflammatory effects have some exposure requirements. For the lung, this is um, for BPD. We think this is about two nanograms per milliliter in the newborn. That's about 0 0.06 milligrams per kilogram of uh, dexamethasone. So this is another thing about lung maturation that's really interesting. Something we found a number of years ago, and that's when you, it, when you cause inflammation with chorioamnionitis, you actually augment fetal lung maturation in rhesus monkeys by giving them the combination of beta acetate, again, the low dose that causes a very low blood level and um, intraamniotic LPS, as you can see with both the PV, PV curve and the uh, saturated PC in the VAL, this low dose works uh, in the face of infection. So how can antenatal steroids be improved? Well, one of the things that nobody talks about when you go consent a mother to give her steroids is that actually only about 40% of the fetuses respond. Uh, lung inflammation causes a more consistent lung maturation in animal models than does antenatal steroids. Uh, it's better to target antenatal steroids who will benefit and consider repeat, repeated doses as possible adverse effect for possible adverse effects. And lower doses are important. It turns out we don't have lower dose data in the human, so I can't actually make a recommendation for what your lower dose should be. But um, there is a, a trial being started in India and Africa and Pakistan by the WHO and the Gates Foundation using a lower dose strategy. That'll take a couple of years to complete. So this is a recent trial uh, that was published last year from uh, the WHO called the Action Trial. It was 3,070 3, fetuses were randomized to four doses of six milligrams of dexamethasone. And I think this is what you're using predominantly in India. It's an, it was an RCT with a controlled trial of antenatal steroids, the first since 1993. For infants with known gestational age and, uh, and risk of imminent death, the birth outcomes were uh, not different. The only in facilities that could provide uh, complete, some delivery and postnatal care for the mother and substantial care for the infant. These are truly not low resource uh, facilities. The trial was stopped after the second uh, DSMC uh, review of the data because there was a decrease in infant death, which was significant. And um, so this trial um, used four doses of DEX. So I think in India, presently, that's the right way to treat women. So why do only 40% of fetuses respond? Well, it could be that the, the drug exposure to each fetus um, because of differences in maternal blood level, placental transfer, 
or fetal levels and clearance. There's different drug exposure. There could be biological difference. So we, what we did is we did a sheep study where we gave uh, mothers either saline or uh, the clinical drug celestone and measured maternal and fetal blood levels. And then we looked at responses and the responses were for PA, PACO2. In turn, you can see that the, the preterm delivered animals that were then ventilated who got, uh, we de defined as responders, um, did pretty well. It turns out that the maternal and uh, fetal total beta methasone levels were identical if you're a responder or a non-responder. So this means that giving more drug isn't going to help uh, because you don't increase the percent responders. What you need to do is use the, the six milligrams of uh, dexamethasone and just recognize that not all fetuses respond. So presumably this is, a, is, is at a receptor level or a biological level in the lung. And that's something we're trying to study. Many women exposed to antenatal steroids do not benefit. The fetus is already mature, even at an early gestational ages. Most fetuses at greater than 34 weeks gestation don't benefit because they have a low, very low risk of RDS or death. So are there opportunities to identify and treat only pregnancies with benefits? We don't know how to do that very effectively. So there's a bunch of residual questions with antenatal steroids. Uh, we do not, do not know the actual low dose that the fetus needs to respond to. In the sheep and the macaque, it's one nanogram per milliliter. So because of biological converge, convergence, it is unlikely to be an artifact. So the value should be about one nanogram per milliliter. And we can figure out what the fetus is exposed to by measuring these things in cord blood. So the take home message is that most preterms uh, have dex or beta in their plasma at delivery, perhaps not beta because it's cleared faster. I do not think we understand the adrenal function of these extremely low, low birth weight infants. I showed you that data that some of these kids have extremely high uh, steroid cortisol levels endogenously. The present antenatal uh, steroid dosing is very high, but I cannot re recommend a, a, a better dose because we don't have any clinical da data. And a uh, there's an increased risk of hypoglycemia with the, this dosing. So this, I'm going to talk about postnatal steroids here for the rest of the talk. My problem here is I'm giving really two talks, one on postnatal and one on uh, antenatal. So when we think about steroids, there's a pharmacologic effect at the high dose range. There's a stress effect that we all need if we're going for surgery. And then there's a, or a lion's chasing you. I guess in India, that would be a tiger. Uh, there's a basal level that we all have to have or we can't maintain our blood pressure. And the toxicity is proportionate to dose and duration of therapy. So there's major pathways in BPD, which may be sensitive to steroids. One is lung development. The other is the issue of injury, and the other is the issue of repair. We don't know how that's, uh, when we give steroids, we're probably affecting these three different er uh, pathways, complex pathways simultaneously. These are a summary of a bunch of recent reports on either inhaled steroids, 10 days of hydrocortisone, or um, targeted steroid use by putting the steroid in the surfactant. And it turns out that there was decreased death with a 10-day hydrocortisone or with the, the uh, budesonide plus surfactant. It seems to me that all of these things have a decrease in BPD and some have a decrease in death. Therefore, the results are convincing proof of principle that early steroid use, uses are probably useful in our preterm infants. The problem is, is which drug, which dose, and which route. So the NIH recently completed a, a, a trial that was just reported in the New England Journal of Medicine. It was a multi-center trial of 800 infants less than 30 weeks of age. The, the treatment was four milligrams per kilogram of hydrocortisone for intubated infants who were at 14 to 28 days of age. The dose of hydrocortisone was tapered over 10 days. There was no difference in hydrocortisone 
zone versus sail, sailing for death or DPD, which were their primary endpoints. The high, high hydrocortisone did uh, permit earlier extubation, but it caused more hypertension in the preterm infants. There was no effect on neurodevelopment or growth at two years of age. So it's reasonably safe to use as long as you're looking out for the hypertension. I want to talk about this trial because most of us, this is how we dose postnatal dexamethasone for uh, that. The previous one is, was hydrocortisone. This is for dexamethasone. Uh, this is the DART trial, which was published in 2006. It's quite interesting because it was designed for like 3,000 babies and they could only enroll 192. 70 were randomized, 35 to dex and 35 to placebo. These are infants that are less than a kilogram, less than 28 weeks on a ventilator at seven days of age. The power calculation for this study was 800 babies. It turned out that they only could treat 70 because th there was this concern about using dexamethasone so people couldn't get consent. This is, I think, conceptually a really important slide from Lex Doyle. It's again a meta regression. The size of the circle is the size of the study. And it's looking at effect on death or uh, cerebral palsy based on the rate of BTBT in your control group. So this is the other little babies in your NICU. So it turns out that if you have a, 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 a BPD rate of about 50%, if you use steroids, you'll have better outcomes in terms of death and CP. If you have a really low incidence of BPD, then it's probably more likely to be toxic. If you have a high incidence, pardon me, a high incidence of, uh, of, of BPD, then it's more likely to be toxic. So there's the, this new approach, which is being studied in two large studies, one in uh, Australia and one in the US by the NICHD Neonatal Network on corticosteroids to prevent BPD. This is mixing budesonide with surfactant when you treat these uh, preterm infants. And we've done some LAM studies. LAMs delivered and ventilated at high tidal volume for 15 minutes to injure the lung. LAMs were, were randomized to uh, 200 milligrams of CuraSurf or surfactant plus mixed with the CuraSurf. And they were ventilated for six hours. And it turns out that the ones that got the budesonide were on lower mean airway pressure. They had a better ventilation efficiency index and they had much lower cytokine levels. So this therapy is now again being trialed. But just as a cautionary note, this is work that, uh, that we've published now. It's in, I can't remember what's published, but this is, these are um, heat diagrams of RNA from the liver of preterm lambs. And it turns out that when you use any steroid, um, you get uh, a large number of uh, genes that are expressed because of the steroid in the liver, in the brain, and in the gut. And this is just to follow up on my concept that I started out with. If you're a, ch uh, a child and you're alveolizing up until the age of about 20, and from that point on, you lose alveoli and you lose uh, the integrity of your small airways, such that if you get below a certain range, you have COPD. And we probably have increased aging with our preterm infants and certainly with our tiny infants that have lung injury. What is optimal antenatal and postnatal steroid treatments for efficacy and decreased uh, potential for injury? Low total fetal exp uh, exposures achieve benefits. So, and we don't need high peak levels and we need a minimum duration of exposure to get a benefit probably about 48 hours. And we're looking for a maximum durability of response so that if we treat the woman uh, will have an effect at seven days when the baby's delivered. We want a rapid onset. We want a high availability and low cost for low income and middle income countries. We want to minimize potential risk for postnatal steroids 
we can probably lower dose. This is a, a, an even newer study about uh, a network, network meta-analysis of 62 studies on 5,500 infants. The primary outcome was mortality, uh, primary outcome was BPD and mortality at 36 weeks. They found in this meta-regression analysis that the best dosing was a moderately early dose. That's between seven and 14 days, eight and 14 days, pardon me, uh, with six systemic dexamethasone, the total dose of two to four milligrams per kilogram. Not grams, I'm sorry about that. Don't give grams <laughs> for eight days. And they said that the, it was a low quality of evidence as this being the best way to dose our post, post baby. So again, to toast the best information we have now for giving postnatal steroids to treat BPD is to give it between eight and 14 days for babies who are on a ventilator, give it for eight days and use a low dose of uh, two to four milligrams per kilogram. But it, 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 it is a low quality of evidence. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir. Is that okay? How long did I go? 40 minutes perfectly, sir. When Good. <laughs> Perfect time. It is so uh, revealing. I was just amazed hearing your talks. I mean, like, this is totally new information. Most of the things are totally, you know, against the, what the prevailing concept. So, like, it's really eye open up the talks. Yeah, well, the problem is, is with the antenatal steroids, we don't have clinical data to tell people what to use as a lower dose. Okay. So I think the, the bottom line is you ought to, you're using dexamethasone in India? Uh, yes, so we are, both uh, people are using both actually, but uh, beta methasone only the phosphate, not the complex salt. So yeah, most of the people are ch now changed to dexamethasone because of this reason. Yeah, yeah. Well, you don't you you don't have the uh, the complex one in India. We, we don't this, have. Oh, we don't. We, have we had to, we had to smuggle that into the country to get that <laughs> use in with women. That is so, what I wanted to ask you. How the that <laughs> trial? Uh, how could that be? We done? actually we we actually did get permission to use it, okay. but it took a it took a long time because it's it's a it's a new drug in your country and. India doesn't like new drugs. <laughs> Probably you are right, sir, regarding that. So at any rate, well, thank you very much. And thank I'm you happy so to much. Salenjo is not available for us in this. Thank you so much. Is he available? I think you will have to stop it. Okay, so end of the lessons, what we learned. It's a very important area because we are constantly, as uh, neonatologists, constantly dealing with preterm babies and uh, management. So the lesson mainly learned from this one is from um, uh, antenatal corticosteroids or magic bullets, definitely for preterm babies and preterm mothers from 24 to 34 weeks of gestation uh, who are in imminent danger of preterm delivery. Actually, in many places, it's overused. What I am saying is for, even for my daughter, she's from North Kerala. Uh, when she reached 32 weeks of gestation, they started giving steroids. The surprise asked them and stopped it. They say, in case she goes into Labor. So that practice may be there in many hospitals also, a surprise, even in Madras, I think, maybe, don't know. So ideally, we should limit it to um, mothers in preterm labor between 24 to 34 weeks. The study about the uh, uh, late preterms and also elective cesarean sessions also, again, confusing. some of the studies have come out showing that it's definitely, it's definitely beneficial in the way that it reduce the incidence of Mild in um, TTN or some respiratory distress or the baby recurring oxygenation or, me or mechanical respiratory support. 
But if you don't give steroids also, they may not require much treatment. It's probably uh, keeping the TTN baby for one day in the hospital like that. So, so that is septic. I may require more studies to come before we say that we give for late treatments as well as for elective cesarean at term. So that is one important point he also said. And another important point he has brought out in the uh, in the discussion is, are we giving very high dose of steroids? Nobody has looked into because so many landmark studies, especially that study in, uh, in that is published in Cochrane, even the Cochrane, that marking is based on that uh, uh, flow chart and what is that um, statistical analysis they put it there on top. So that, that study definitely showed it reduced the respir respiratory distress syndrome to the tune of about 34%, reduced IVH and also NEC and also late onset sepsis. So that is the only study. So nobody had done uh, so much studies on the dose. Alan Job saying that we have a less, lesser dose may be enough for this. So somebody should do studies on that also. And regarding postnatal steroids, he said the same. We all follow that DART trial principle only. Uh, moderately early dosing, that means from 8 to 14 days, dexamethasone, 2 to 4 milligram per kg. That has been shown as the best dosing. And that too, in only in situations we are stuck with the baby, we are not able to extubate the baby. In such situations, go for early, uh, moderately early steroids. Otherwise, a very early steroid as well as late steroids, both can have problems. Then uh, another study here, he showed that what is by, done by Ray Conan et al. in JAMA, this 2020, it has been published, that um, many mothers who get steroids, they don't deliver prematurely, but they go on to term. And these children followed up 10 or 12 years later, they seem to have behavioral or neurological problems or even mental retardation. So that's a bit worrying, but all said and done, we are concerned about the positive effect of antenatal steroids. And in Indian situation, it's different also. Even in, there was a study recently from India showed that only 57% of the mothers are getting steroids. So we are still at the other side. So definitely the good effects of antenatal steroids should be there, but at the same day, we should be careful about its overuse also. That is the main thing. You would have been there, but he is, I think, is uh, laid up and is going for a major surgery or something. And otherwise, you would have been here. Also. So, uh, anything on to Leela, Dr. Leela? Your experience? Uma, you will be dealing with a lot of cases, teacher and babies. Um, it's very true that uh, sometimes antenatal steroids are uh, overused. So we are always on extremes. Either like we use, uh, we do not use. If we start using like we overuse. So we, we have to balance uh, all the aspects. I think uh, that should be from our OBG colleague rather than from us. Uh, postnatal steroids, uh, uh, we uh, kind of uh, use uh, the calculator, NACHT calculator to calculate the uh, risk of uh, BPD or BPD calculator. And if the risk is more than 60%, uh, uh, then uh, we consider postnatal steroids. Uh, so we use the DART regime as such uh, uh, in our unit. But uh, I would say that it is only very minimal usage of uh, postnatal steroids. Uh, I think we, we are running uh, out of time. So probably we can stop this and go on to the. So thank you very much for...